So um, how many of you have been through uh, personality typing at one time or another, like taking some kind of inventory of, you know, there's, yeah, well, yeah, that's general. if it's happened once for you, it's probably happened a hundred times. So um, they, they range from the ones that try to give you certain letters. Um, there, there's a disk assessment, and then there's, of course, there's Myers-Briggs, and there's all these other different types of assessments. Um, there are those that compare you to animals. And, you know, it's like, well, I'm a rabbit, and, well, I'm a turtle, and, well, no, I'm one of these or one of that. And uh, it boggles my mind how many different types of classifications there are uh, for helping us to kind of figure ourselves out or figure out the people around us. And so um, I think that they're helpful, and I don't want us as Christians to just throw it out because it's all just the wisdom of humans and, you know, that it, it, it's not going to be something, you know, if it's not in the Bible, then it's worthless. Well, then you can't drive a car anymore because there's no car in the Bible, right? So, um, but I do think that there's some value there. And I think that there is something spiritual about knowing yourself and in knowing what gifts did God give me, uh, what passions did he put in my heart. You know, some people just have a certain passion for a certain thing and uh, they're going to fight for it tooth and nail until the day they die. And, you know, I think those are, are reflective of God's character. And sometimes it may even be in a way that you don't, um, you can't really appreciate or understand, uh, maybe until, you know, we meet Jesus face to face. And sometimes it happens in other people. It's like, I don't know why you care about that so much, because that's meaningless to me. And, you know, that sometimes that causes some friction between us. Um, it was interesting to me that, um, Several pastors around the country are, are going through a training system where we, we're using a personality typing and then they're going and they're taking it to the next level and they're saying, okay, how does your personality change when you're under stress? And what can you expect from other personality types who may be on your team or in your church? And what do those mean for your relationships? And so it, it doesn't just call you a turtle and then say, well, congratulations, you're a turtle. You know, it's more like, so you're a turtle and you're a rabbit. How does a turtle talk to a rabbit? You know, it's kind of a, it, it's a wacky analogy, but it's kind of a, how does this, how does this play out in the context of a church family? How does this play out in the context of leadership and teams? Um, so one of the things that I learned about myself was that I knew I was kind of a perfectionist, but I didn't realize that, uh, and this kind of makes me sound like, a, sound like a pessimist, but part of my um, personality is that I tend to not be satisfied unless something is living up to its ideal. So if we are at 90% of something, I'm going to focus on the 10% that we lack. So it's like, well, look at this great community event that we did. Look at all this that went right. And I'm like, yeah, but this didn't work out and that didn't work out. And that really bugs me. And so it's just part of my personality. It doesn't mean that I'm a pessimist, but it's like I'm an idealist and I like to see things as what they could be. And I didn't realize that, but it really does describe me. And so it's like, well, that's interesting. If you're always looking at the 10% that's lacking, well, that would be something to kind of watch out for because it could be kind of depressing, right? Um, and it occurs to me that maybe we do that uh, in terms of Scripture and when we're reading the Bible. Um, there's an overwhelming abundance of Scriptures that talk to us about the love of God. And yet, what do we tend to focus on but those stories in the Old Testament where Israel got itself in trouble again? Or we focus on those Scriptures where there's talk of punishment. And so we say, well, what does that mean? Or there's uh, passages that seem to be talking about some kind of hellfire or some kind of you know, place of torment. What do we do with those? And so just like anything else, we tend to zero in on the scary stuff, the things we don't understand, whereas there's all this other good stuff. And we tend to say, yeah, 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 that's good. But what, what is this about? And so we zero in on some of that stuff that doesn't make as much sense to us or, you know, that scares us. So I thought it would be good. What if, you know, we talk about how God is love and how he wants to be in relationship with us, but we don't always go to those scriptures because we just kind of say, well, it's just, it's there. We all know that. So we'll, we'll move ahead. So I thought today would be a good opportunity to review some of those things because each of us gets exposed to the goodness of God. We get exposed to his mercy, to his love. Maybe you hear a song on the radio or you hear a, 
um, a television preacher or a, you know some kind of a message on the radio or you read a book and it's inspiring and it's encouraging to you and then we might go along our way and then say well okay yeah that was good but now I'm worried about this other thing so what if we were to actually kind of go through and say wait a minute how do we know that's God's love again how do we know that he actually is merciful show me some proof that he actually cares about me because Sometimes we open our Bible to the wrong place and it's like, wow, Leviticus is kind of scaring me this morning, you know, and you're just flipping through and it's like, I don't, I, I don't know how I stack up against. And then, then maybe you flip and you say, okay, I need some gospels, I need some New Testament. And then you, you flip over and then you're on the Sermon on the Mount and then it's a matter of, well, you know, if your eye causes you to sin, we'll pluck it out. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. And you're like, oh my goodness, I just do not stack up today. But again, <laughs> It's the matter of, is it the 90% or is it the 10%? And so sometimes we miss the 90%. So I wanted to review some of those things today. And I want to put it in the context of belief and choosing to believe what is true. Because belief and faith are not just about believing God came in the form of Jesus. It's not just the, the matter of believing Jesus was who he said he is. Even demons know that. Even demons believe that, right? So if we say, yes, I know there's a God, and yes, I know Jesus came to earth to be the way for us, to die for our sins, to show us the way to live in our place, that's still not quite getting the whole point because Christianity and discipleship is not just a matter of knowing the facts. It's not what you know, it's who you know. So I want to take a look at some of those today. So we want to start in Romans 8, verses 1 to 2. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Well, you know, Romans is a really fun, easygoing, light, chap light book to go through, right? I mean, this is beach reading material, right? Now, Romans is pretty dense and theological. We get doctrinal it, ideas from Romans. Uh, sometimes you read through and you think, well, you know, this will be good. I'll, 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 you know, check out Romans today. And it's a matter of, man, this is a textbook. Because sometimes Romans can feel that way. So you kind of have to break it down and say, all right, <clears throat> therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay, no condemnation. Okay, got it. But do we get it? Let's stop there for a second. If there is no condemnation, from whom? Well, hopefully there's no condemnation from God for those who are in Christ Jesus. But I would argue there is condemnation from ourselves. How often do we go through focusing on our lacking? I mean, that happens to me day after day. It's like, well, so what if I was productive today? Look at the stuff I didn't do. So what if I behaved well here? Look at how I misbehaved. And I think that we focus on that other stuff when the point is there is no condemnation. So it's a bit like Jesus saying to the woman caught in adultery, where are your accusers? And in our place, often it's, well, I'm my accuser. So if there's no condemnation, why do we insist on heaping it on anyway? Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, which is the law of love, right, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. Now, do we know that there's freedom? Yeah. Do we believe it? Do we experience it? Do we let it settle in, or do we just kind of brush it off like, yeah, I know, but I'm a miserable sinner. Yeah, I know, but... I didn't pray enough this week. Yeah, I know, but it's been a, a little while since I did Bible study. Yeah, I know, but, 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 and then we just keep condemning ourselves. But it says right here, there is no condemnation, so why do we heap on what Jesus is not doing? It's right there. There is no condemnation. So to me, that's a good reminder to say, hey, you know what? The slate's clean. I just keep forgetting that. It's all good, and yet I just keep forgetting and then leaving that belief behind. So believe that we do have this clean slate. Believe that Christ has washed our sins clean. 
Let's look at another part of Romans 8. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Stop. Do we live in fear? Pretty often. I think a lot of people were afraid before the election. Some people still are. No matter who won, half the country would have been afraid before and after. And I think we fear God. Again, we know there's no condemnation, and yet often there's a fear of, I think he's mad at me. Or I think I've pushed his limits too far. And we were just talking about David this morning. If anyone can push buttons, it would be David, right? And yet David was a man after God's own heart. So again, there ought not be fear, and yet we kind of pile it on. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Okay, so what do we do about that? Well, the spirit you received brought about our adoption to sonship. And by him, the Holy Spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, you've probably heard this before, but let's say you're raising a toddler and the toddler is taking its first steps and the toddler trips and falls. Do you become enraged with the toddler? Do you say, you know what, you're never going to walk correctly, so forget this. We're just going to skip this whole walking thing. Apparently, you're not cut out for it. Hopefully, you'll get the driving thing later on. I don't know how we're going to get you out of the car, but you know the, whole, the walking thing is done. It doesn't work like that because the parent continues to work with the child and expects the child to fall. And that's part of the beauty of this whole sonship thing, this whole being a child. Yes, it might seem like we push it too far. It's like, well, we're adults. We're not kids. Really? Do we always act like adults? When I'm driving, I, know, I see a lot of people not acting like adults. When I'm in Walmart or Target or Best Buy, I see a lot of people not acting like adults. When I see people on the news, when I see interviews, when I see people posting crazy things on Facebook, I'm thinking they're not acting like adults. We're still such little child children in so many different ways. And compared to God, we always will be. So just embrace it. We're going to be little kids in a spiritual sense. By him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And if we're going to talk about listening to God, listen to that. If the Holy Spirit testifies with our spirit, you're a child of God. That's what we ought to listen to. If I'm going through the week and I'm doubting myself and I'm doubting my performance as a Christian or as a disciple or as a human being, the Spirit testifies we are God's children, and kids mess up. Children mess up. But yet, it's not about slavery, it's not about fear, it's about trying again, right? John 15, 15. I no longer call you servants, because a servant doesn't know what his master's business is. Instead, I've called you friends, for everything I learned from my Father I've made known to you. Now, some people might argue, well, he was talking to the disciples. He wasn't talking to us. Well, let's look at that. He says, I call you friends for everything that I learned from my Father I've made known to you. Well, pretty much what Jesus made known to the disciples is made known to us through Scripture. That's not to say every word, but aren't we also disciples? Aren't we also children? And if we are in that same kind of relationship with Jesus that the first disciples were, then we also deserve to be called friends. Everything that I learned from my Father have made known to you. So there's this invitation to family and friendship and teamwork and participation that tends to fly outside of what we default to think about God. It's kind of like, I serve God. I go to church, I give my, my offering, I, you know, I, I 
count the offering, I do the coffee, I sweep the floor, I do whatever. But that's not what he's saying. I don't call you servants. You can manage your building all you want. That's not what I'm talking about. He says, a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I call you friends for everything that I learned from my father I've made known to you. You know, if we just read this particular scripture every morning when we woke up, I think it would help our mental health. I have a friend in God. 1 John 3, 19 to 24. This is a couple screens worth, but it's really good reminders here. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, remember we just went there, if our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands Again, are we talking about the Ten Commandments? Are we talking about the Leviticus commands? No, we're talking about the commands of love. Love God and love each other. If we're keeping his commands and doing what please him, then he gives us whatever we ask. And we just heard in our video this morning, God's desire is that he give us whatever we want, but he has to work on our wanter first. This is his command to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Again, what kind of belief are we talking about? Is it just that he exists? Well, it says believe in his name. So we believe it's spelled J-E-S-U. Is that, is that the belief part? No, the belief is an act of participation, acceptance in, and love of Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands live, lives in him and he in them. Well, wait a second. That sounds conditional. So if I don't keep God's commands, then he won't live in me, right? No. That's not what it's saying. The one who keeps his, God's commands, the one who desires to keep his commands, the one who is continually in communion with God and chasing after those commands as one after God's own heart, the one who keeps God's commands as a part of his being lives in him and he in them. It's not conditional, it's a description. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit that he gave us. Once again, you've got kind of a down payment on a kingdom that's going to last forever. And number two, that spirit testifies to us, you're his child. It's kind of funny because sometimes I, I want to encourage myself and encourage others, but I'm so perplexed by my own silliness that I don't remember these things. I don't know, do you ever notice that about yourself where it's like, I know this, but I forget it, and I don't know why I keep forgetting or why I tend to push it aside. We focus on that 10% that we may not be doing right. We focus on our mistakes when it says here, look, it's okay. And if we keep focus on, I'm doing this wrong, I'm not doing this, I did this incorrectly, I ought to, it's constantly I, 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 and if Satan wants to twist anything, that sounds about right to me that, oh, okay, you know what, your walk with Jesus isn't right, keep focusing on that, keep focusing on you, forget the people around you, and suddenly you've blown the whole thing in terms of, well, God just asks you to love him and love the people around you. It's gonna be hard to love God and the people around me if I'm constantly doing a checklist of my own behavior and constantly wondering, am I righteous enough? Am I good enough? Is my heart in the right place? Then it's all about me. 1 John 3, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, because that's what we are. Again, the sense of family, the sense of acceptance. He can't call us family and then say, if you behave yourself. If you were to adopt a child tomorrow, it's not a conditional adoption, is it? We'll see how you work out. 
if you don't get the whole riding a bike thing, if you don't get the whole doing your homework, going to bed on time, eating your vegetables, if you don't do that stuff, you're out. So this is just a conditional adoption. That's not what we have. It's permanent. But I think in our hearts, sometimes we make it conditional. Ephesians 3. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. That's interesting. Who was the original family? Who started the whole thing? We have our little families. It's almost a, a, a silly, pale reflection of a real family. So if we understand what it's like to love a family, how much more does God love us? Beyond what we can understand. It's every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, we'll stop there, glorious riches. We're not talking about piles of gold. We're talking about abundance of love and grace. Out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. If you have confidence that you're loved by God, then if that's at the core, everything else can fall away. In your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I feel like this kind of backs up what I was saying about Satan twisting everything. Because it says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. If I don't experience it, if I don't accept it, then how am I going to really have it as the core of my being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith? If we're constantly thinking about ourselves and how we don't measure up, then in a sense, how is Christ going to live in our hearts? I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp, and this is the great one that we could probably all quote by memory, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. It doesn't really get any clearer than that. Here's another one put on your daily reading list. And it's kind of funny how he contradicts himself because he says to know what can't be known. It's like, <laughs> try to comprehend, but you won't get there. He says, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. At least be aware that there's an infinite Thing out there. You can't wrap your mind around it. What's, what's so huge? His love that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. If we ever doubt ourselves, if we ever doubt God's love for us, if we ever get to a point where we're depressed about our performance or what we do wrong, come straight back here to Ephesians. You have no idea. Some friends of ours like to say, oh, you don't even know. You don't even know how wide and long and deep and high the love of Christ. That's where we live. That's the center of our being. If God then is for us, then who can be against us? Again, that's a nice thing to put on a plaque, but do we believe it? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Well, we do, sadly, but who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Nobody really can with any merit. It is God who justifies. 
So guess what? Even if we got it turned around and we started to feel really good about ourselves, that doesn't matter either. In the final analysis, our evaluation of ourselves is kind of irrelevant. It's God's evaluation of us, and when he looks at us, he sees Christ who did everything perfectly. It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it's written, for your sake we face death all day long, for we're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. If we're going to get a grasp on reality, this is the reality. If it's any lie we need to get rid of, it's the lie of Satan whispering in your ear day after day, you're not doing it right. You're messing up. You did it again. You're a failure. There, there's this concept that Satan is basically, because of the saving work of Jesus, Satan is a caged lion, uh, this animal that likes to make a lot of noise and likes to scare you, but in essence can't touch you. Because Jesus put those bars around him. And there's nothing he can do to tear us apart except just constantly growl and, and kind of, you know, take his paw and scratch at you. But you just kind of, you know, you step back. And there's nothing he can do except scare you. So then all day long, he's going to keep scaring us and saying, you're not doing it right. That's not enough. That's not quite right. You're messing up again. And then we stop believing the truth. We start believing the lie when it says here, nothing else is going to be able to separate us from the love of God. It's all right here, and this is the truth that we tend to forget so easily. So I want us to keep that in mind it was as we go into communion, because it's what Christ did for us that makes all of this possible. This is the story that we know well, but it's uh, from 1 Corinthians instead of the Gospel accounts. It says, The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It came up this week in the Bible study on Wednesday about the covenants and what is the law. And so we talked about how the old covenant, the law, was the law of Moses. And with the new covenant, which is established right here, the new covenant established in Jesus' blood. And the new covenant is one of love, where we love God and he loves us. And it's that simple. And yet we always complicate. So we bring back ourselves to the truth. We remind ourselves through the elements and through our worship every week about God's love. Will you pray with me? Father, help us to remember just how much you deeply love each and every one of us at the deepest level of our heart. You search through the darkest parts where we think we can hide. You search through every part of us. You know every part of us. And rather than being ashamed, Father, this is good news because you can clean out everything that doesn't reflect your love and your spirit. 
It's already been forgiven through the saving work of Jesus. It's all done, and somehow, in a way we don't even understand, we have a clean slate. Everything is wiped clean. Father, help us to truly believe in your love at the deepest level. We ask for your blessing on these elements as memorials for us, as remembrance of what Jesus accomplished in wiping away our sin, in providing a new covenant, and in living and dying for us, that we can have faith that it's sufficient, and then we can go forward with Jesus as friends and as part of your family and your team working for the kingdom. We ask for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. As usual, we have uh, grape juice in the middle on the top ring, and then we've got the wine on the outside. I'll just take a cup and a piece of bread back to your seat, and we'll take it together. <laughs>